Let's pray, Father. We well, thank you. We well, love you. We well, appreciate what you have done in our lives. We well, are asking, Lord, this day, your hand, mighty, will be upon everyone. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Good, good, amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Mage for more. You and I are made for more. Whatever we've got, whatever we've, we've experienced, we are made for more. And whatever we have achieved in ministry, we're made for more. And so you think about yourself, personal, everything we say, everything we read, you personalize. You say, that's me. Maybe you are not there yet, but that's me. I'll be there. You will be there. We shall be there. We're talking about more grace for greater exploits in ministry. More grace. Look at James chapter 4. We're looking at verse 6. In James chapter 4 verse 6, but he gives more grace. But he gives more grace. As you look at that word grace, you think of grace. You think of more grace. You think of much grace. You think of manifold grace. Many people stop at grace. But there's more grace. That was said. He gives more grace. And there is much grace. And there is manifold grace. Manifold means many sided grace. That is this area grace. That area grace. I thought many people say that grace is only for salvation. There's more. Grace is also for sanctification. The sanctification of the believer that the Lord purifies, purges, even perfects him. Grace, number one, for salvation. Number two, grace for sanctification. Number three, grace for steadfastness. You see, there are people, they begin, they don't know how to continue. They are not steadfast. One day, they're weak. The other day, they are strong. But when you are steadfast, number one, grace for salvation. Number two, grace for sanctification. Number three, grace for steadfastness. And then, number four, there's grace for suffering. What? Yes. Grace for suffering. Here, Paul, the apostle, said he was buffeted by Satan, by the messenger of Satan. He went to pray, and God did not remove the buffeting. And he prayed again, he prayed again, and the Lord said, In that buffeting, in that suffering, my grace is sufficient for you. There's grace for salvation. There's grace for sanctification. There's grace for steadfastness. There's grace for suffering. It says, whoever will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And the people that do not know there is more grace, they only think we have grace for salvation when suffering comes, when persecution comes, they question God, why, why, why? Instead of asking for more grace, much grace, manifold grace. There's grace for salvation, for sanctification, for steadfastness, and for suffering. There's grace for service, for service. It says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And the grace that he has given me has made me to labor more than them all. 
there is grace for service. The Lord calls to it his service. And the service is greater than what you have. The, the service is greater than what you have done in the past. And you say, how can I do this? And he says, by grace. Not only for salvation. The grace is available for service. Number six, there's grace for success. Want to succeed in the ministry. The Lord told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate therein. Meditate therein. What does that mean? I look at the assignment. I look at the duty. I look at the job he has given me to do. And I say, how can I do this? And I look at the scripture. And I take that scripture and meditate on that scripture. How do I meditate on the scripture? One, I read. I read that scripture. Two, I understand that scripture. And I say, this is what it says. It says what it means. It means what it says. No matter how great promise the Lord is given, He says what it means. It means what it says. I read. I understand. I apply. I personalize. This is not just for the Old Testament people. It's for me. And this is not just for the New Testament people. It's for me. This is not for some special people. It's for me. I personalize that scripture. I apply that scripture to myself. If there is something to do there, I do it. If there's something to pray about there, I pray about it. If there's something uh, to memorize and to bring into my life so that when the challenge comes, I can say that is mine. I read, I understand, I apply, I practice. You see, if I don't practice the scripture, if I don't do what it says, it's like I've never read it. It's like I do not make it part of my life. I so practice it until it becomes part of my nature. That it's almost like second nature. This is me. This is what I used to be. And this is heaven's addition to my life. That's how we understand the script. And now I pray read. I pray read the scripture. What does that mean? If I don't know how to pray, I open, for example, this verse. He gives more grace. And I go to pray. I pray read. I say, Lord, you talk about grace. I talk about more grace. I need more grace, I need more grace, I need manifold grace. And Lord, I'm asking you about grace. And what is grace? G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. And I say, Lord, everything that Calvary has provided, I need. I pray, read. You said you'll give me more grace, more grace today than the grace of yesterday because the challenge of today is greater than the challenge of yesterday. I'm praying, reading. I'm reading the scriptures and I'm praying according to what I read. This is what you promise. Fulfill your promise and give me more grace and give me much grace and give me manifold grace. When your grace is my life, Lord, I will not fail. I will not fall and I will not fade. That's why, Lord, I'm asking you. You said I shall ask and I will receive. You said I shall seek and I will find. You said I, will, I should not 
and you will open the door. I'm asking for more grace. I'm seeking for more grace and I'm kind of knocking for more grace. I'm praying, reading the scripture. And I said, your word says, he giveth. He giveth. Thank you, Lord. You're still giving today to me. You gave me yesterday. You gave me last year. You gave me salvation that time. You gave me steadfastness all these years. You have given me sanctification as I prayed. I trusted you. And then in the suffering of the, of the persecution, you've given me grace. I need grace for this particular thing today. He giveth. He giveth. He. He, the Lord he, the creator, he, the redeemer, he, the father of the Lord Jesus. Can remember, I'm looking at that scripture and I'm praying, reading the scripture. And then it says, wherefore, he says, God resisted the proud. I say, God, I'm now in the kingdom. I believe in you. I trust in you. We're coming to Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, we're looking at verse 31. In verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they speak the word. Look at that. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they didn't remain there inside their room, inside their chamber, just speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. When they were filled again, filled afresh with the Holy Ghost, they went out and they spoke the word with boldness. That's what the grace of God does in our lives. When you are timid, it gives you fearlessness. When you are kind of cringing, it gives you boldness now. You'll be bold. For God, you will be bold. For the kingdom of God, you will be bold. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, it tells us, and with great power, great power, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace look at that there's grace there's more grace there's much grace there's manifold grace and there's great grace grace greater than your strength grace greater than your challenge Grace greater than the assignment he has given you. And great grace was upon them all. If I were to pre-read that, I'll say, Lord, there's no exception upon them all. I am part of the church upon them all. I'm part of the ministers who have called, you have consecrated, and you have commissioned, and you told me to go, and when you call anyone, there is grace available for them, upon them all. Will you, Lord, therefore, give me the great grace I need for the work you've given me to do? I read, I pray according to what I read. We're talking today on more grace for greater exploits in ministry. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, sufficient grace for saints and servants in his kingdom. Look at number two. Number two, we're looking at spiritual gifts for seekers of souls for the king. Number three, we're looking at sustained goals by shepherds and subjects under his kingliness. Kingliness. That he is, is a king. is royal. Under his royalty. Under his kingliness. Now we're coming to, we're talking about, you know, three things. Number one is grace. Number two, gifts. 
Number three, goals. And we have to start from there because we do not have anything, possess anything of ourselves. We need His grace. And after that grace, there's work to do. We need His gifts. And then once we have the grace and the gifts, we have goals. And the goal is where we're going, is what we're doing, is what we're going to accomplish for the Lord, the goals. And, uh, you know, you don't have any goal, then there's no achievement. You must have a goal. The goal you want to reach and the goal you want to touch and the goal, the thing you want to accomplish and achieve. Look at number one. Number one, we're talking about sufficient grace for saints, the saints are believers. The word saint in the New Testament, another word for a believer. Sufficient grace for saints and servants in his kingdom. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved, not by works, not by activity, not by duty, not by responsibility. Salvation comes as a result of the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. A look at Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 11. In Titus chapter 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Here I am. I'm thirsty. I cannot dig out water from this platform. I cannot, you know, look at this at the ceiling. Let the ceiling bring water. No. But there ain't somebody there brings the water. Savior, Jesus, he knows I cannot dig out salvation. I cannot possess. And so the grace of God brings salvation. And then it tells me it has appeared unto all men. It's yours. It's mine. And whatever grace I can have, you can have. Whatever grace Paul or Peter, whatever grace they had, I can have. I don't say uh, that's, you know, New Testament, those are apostles, those are the people that ate and lived with Jesus. The same, the same. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men and has appeared to you. Amen. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, teaching us the grace, teaching us. You see, there are people that have grace, and the grace is there. Quiet, silent, dormant, doesn't say anything, doesn't teach anything, doesn't lead any way. The grace of God that has appeared to all men, bringing salvation to all men, and you say, teaching us. That denying of godliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly. We live by grace. We don't live by struggling, struggling. It's like the Lord says, I'll carry your load, I'll solve your problem, I will give you my life and the life I live. And if I were to be on earth now, the life I will be living, I'll give that to you as a gift. I learned of an old woman, when we say an old man, nothing against an old woman, but she was staying by the side of the road. She wanted a um, vehicle to carry her, and she had a big load there that she could carry on the head or on the shoulder. And so this uh, generous, gracious driver passing by stopped and said, Mother, where are you going? And she mentioned the place, and the driver happens to be going 
that same place. And so the driver said, you are like my mommy because as I look at you, as, you are as old as my mother. Mother, please come in. And then she came in with her load. But the driver was driving on and driving on. And she just, looked, the driver looked back. And Mama was sitting on a good, uh, you know, uh, seat there with her load on her head. So the driver stopped and said, Mother, what's the matter? You carry your load on your head while you're sitting there on the seat. Oh, he said, my son, I didn't want to give you extra body. That's why. I'm sitting here. You have been so good and gracious to give me a seat in the glory, in the vehicle. And should I expect more? Should I take your offer for granted and put my load also there? Oh, the driver said, Mother, the glory, the car, the vehicle carries you and your load. And even if you put it on the head, the lorry, the car, is still carrying the weight of mama and the weight of her load. And so mama now understood the lorry is for you and for your load. You can put it down. The same thing with the grace of God. I'm saved. Now I have challenge. Then I begin to struggle by myself. No. The grace is to carry you and your problem. No more struggling, no more trying, and no more sweating. Then the Lord he now makes us to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. Because the grace of God has come, he sustains us. Grace for salvation, grace for sanctification, grace for steadfastness until the blessed hope is realized and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself and sanctify unto himself remember we're talking about the grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared unto all men and that grace is sufficient for your salvation is sufficient for sanctification. Is sufficient for your steadfastness. I'm not strong. Grace comes in, makes you strong. I don't know how to be consistent and steadfast in what I should be doing. The grace comes and makes you steadfast. I do not know in my persecution, in my challenges, how I can stand. The grace of God comes, it'll make you stand. You will stand. You will stand. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Somebody said, when I see these zealous people, how they drive, how they move, how they act, and they, how they are still preaching at such a time. I say, I wish I could have such passion. I wish I could have such pursuit. I wish I could have such zeal. The grace of God makes you a peculiar person. It's not by trying. It's by trusting. It's not by fretting and sweating. It's by faith and by the grace of God. Now that he can purify you to be a peculiar person. Zealous of good works. The Lord will do much more than you have ever got. He'll do in your life in Jesus' name. That from this time. 
that we are together that you understand the secret of zeal for the Lord, the secret of steadfastness, and the secret of being everything you ought to be. That secret is in the Lord, you will be what He has created you to be. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's all we need. That's what, why we go to the Lord in prayer. I want to be everything God wants me to be. How do I do that? By fasting 40 days? No, no. How do I do that? By looking at somebody like a hero and I try to copy him. When you copy um, somebody, it's like when you have something written down and you're copying that thing from what is written down. After you finish copying, look at your copy and look at the original. Your copy will never be like the original. So copying a hero, copying a man, copying a preacher, copying somebody, you will never be an original because you are a copy. But the apostle said, I could have tried to copy Peter. I could have tried to copy John. I could have tried to copy Andrew. But no, no. Because a copy will never be like the original. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's the secret. You are going to be who you ought to be. The grace of God will flush weakness out of your life. Will flush a kind of impotence and uh, um, weakness out of your life in Jesus' name. Look at this. And it's grace which was bestowed upon me. The grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Let's say now I'm having my personal devotion before the Lord. And I come across this verse. I say, Lord, you've made me a pastor. I need your grace to be who I ought to be. You've made me an evangelist, an evangelist with demonstration, an evangelist with evidence. Lord, by your grace, I want to be who I ought to be. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And your grace, which have been bestowed upon me, must not be in vain. When I go out to do what you have sent me to do, there must be no failure. There must be no fainting. There must be no fretting. There must be achievement, accomplishment, because... Your grace, which you have given to me, will not be in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Grace makes me not to compare myself with another person. But I can labor. I can preach. I can run. I can do whatever he wants me to do more than they all. We get weakened when we look at other people. Why am I the only one going to the nations and going everywhere and evangelizing? How about him? How about him? When Peter looked at John following, he said, Lord Jesus, look at John. You've told me what I will do. Look at John. What will this man do? Do. And Jesus said, what is that to you about other people? What's that to you about what John will do, what James will do, what others will do? Follow thou me. No comparison. Maybe they're not doing as much as you're doing. No complaint. Maybe the challenge they have is not like you have. No complaint. But the grace of God I am 
what I am. I am what I am. And the grace of God which was given unto me has not been in vain. Will you take all these things and you understand them and you ruminate and meditate on them in your heart every day? The grace of God will carry you. The grace of God will sustain you. The grace of God will wipe your tears away. The grace of God will take the tiredness away from you. The discouragement, the grace of God will take the discouragement away from you. Let me give you one more verse before I go to the next point. As seen, uh, it's in Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. It says, and say to Archippus. Never have you ever come across that name before? You know Peter, you know John, you know a bit of Andrew, you know Matthew, you know Luke, you know John, and you know all those other people, you know Mary. We've come across their name. Here is a new name, and it says, Say to Archippus. I've not seen Archippus before. I'm seeing that in the New Testament for the first time. I've not seen you before. I'm looking at you for the first time. And the Lord said, I shall say to you, you are the Archippus. The new man. The new woman. I've not, what's your touch? Are you a bishop? I don't know. I'm just meeting you. Are you a pastor? I don't know. I'm just meeting you. Are you an evangelist? I don't know. I'm just meeting you for the first time. I'm meeting Archippus for the first time. And the Lord said, I shall say to him, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. You have received something from the Lord, in the Lord. Take heed. Watch over that thing. Don't you know you are watching over other people so that they will do well. They will stand right. That's all right. That's all right. But number one, watch and take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. Look at this. That thou fulfill it. That thou fulfill it. That's what he said. I shall say to you. Now the grace of God is coming. Grace, more grace, much grace, manifold grace. And that with that grace in your life, now you fulfill the ministry. What does that mean? Fulfill. Separate those word, that word in the middle. Fulfill. Full, feel, feel it full. Look at the glass, like glass of water. And look at the water at the middle. It says, fill it up until it is full. The glass is your time. And the time you are spending less than half of the cup. Fill it full with your time. The glass is the assignment you have. And as you look at it, you're giving some effort, a little effort to that glass. Fill it full. Fill it full with all the grace you have. Fill it full with all the gifts you have. Fill it full with all the strength you have. Fill it full with all the time you have. And when you fill it full, feel full, fulfill You'll fulfill the ministry God has given you. You will. You will. Because there's sufficient grace for saints and servants in his kingdom. We're coming to number two. Number two, we're looking at spiritual gifts for seekers of souls for the king. The king is Jesus. And he gives every tool you need. Every instrument you need. And he makes you a renewed tool. 
a renewed instrument that will do the work of the Lord. But you know, he gives us the necessary gift. Necessary gift. The gift of a doctor is different from the gift of the engineer. And there's no point an engineer going to the government and saying, nah, the doctor is my friend. And you've given him all this tool, all this equipment to work with. Yes, but are you a doctor? No, I'm an engineer, but he is my friend. Is your friend, but you have a different calling. You have the calling of an engineer. You will have the gifts and the tools that fit what God has called you to do. The same thing as we look at the calling of God in the New Testament. There's an apostle, he has appropriate gifts. There's a prophet, he has appropriate gifts. There is an evangelist, he has appropriate gifts. There is a pastor, a shepherd, he has appropriate gifts. There's a teacher, he has appropriate gifts. The point is, you're a seeker for soul of souls for the king. And as you're seeking for souls, if you're seeking like an evangelist, there are gifts appropriate for you. If you're seeking, not like um, you know, an apostle, there are gifts that are available appropriate for you. Spiritual gifts for seekers of souls for the king. As you look at John chapter 4 verse 10. In John chapter 4 verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that says unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked he of him, and he would have given thee living waters that gives available for everyone. This is a woman. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, and who is he, the Savior, asking you for a water, you would have given him the water, and he would have given you living waters. That's salvation. That's eternal life. That's forgiveness. That's freedom. And that is becoming a member of the family of God. And that's the first gift. We don't get that gift of salvation by trying. You get it by trusting. I said it before. You don't get it by walking, walking, and walking, and walking. The people that walk for the, for the, in the work of the Lord, but they do not have relationship with the Lord of the work. You go to any regular church and when you get in, you see this one is walking uh, and scrubbing the floor. This one is walking uh, and arranging the chairs. This one is walking uh, and is doing some great, great work. But you say, sir, can I ask you a question? Yes, please go ahead. Why are you walking? I'm walking for the Lord. Do you know the Lord of the work? He says, what do you mean? How do I know the Lord of the work? I don't know the Lord of the work, but I know the work of the Lord. You need to stop and ask yourself, the Lord of the work, the Lord of the ministry. You need to be connected with him. You need to be converted to him. You need to be committed unto him. There is the connection we have to the Lord of the work. And when we have got that salvation, now we can do the work of the Lord. Gift. The gift of salvation. Look at verse, look at Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter 5, uh, I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 17, it says, For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. It's talking about the offense of Adam that brought sin into the world. By the offense of one man, death reigned by one much more. 
they that received abundance of the grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. We we'll receive the gift of righteousness. We cannot buy it in any grocery store. We cannot buy that righteousness in any shop. We cannot buy that righteousness in any denomination. Hey, look at the denomination and ask them, where are the stores of commodities you have in the denomination? Any denomination, they can take you to the store. Here we have Bibles. Here we have hymn books. Here we have the book of common prayer. Here we have uh, the constitution of our church. Do you have in the store the gift of righteousness? What are you talking about? No, we don't store those gifts. That gift you can only get from Christ as you believe uh, on him. The gift of righteousness. We have the gift of salvation. We have the gift of righteousness, and it says, those that receive the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. I pray the gift of salvation, gift, gift, you don't pay anything, come to Christ, it's yours in Jesus' name. The gift of righteousness. We don't buy us a gift. And it will be given to everyone in Jesus' name. We're looking at Acts chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 38 and verse 39. Acts chapter 2. Reading from verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized everyone in the name of of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Very simple. Jesus, the Savior, is available for everyone. And as you repent, you turn away from everything contrary to Christ. That's it. You know, you want Christ, his King, his Lord, his Savior, his Redeemer, is the giver of eternal life and you've been facing this direction and i say i'm you know i'm directing you who are you looking for i'm looking for jesus oh it's not there turn you'll find him here that turning is repentance you turn from everything opposed to christ and contrary to christ and you turn to him repent and he says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. When you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you are saying, I believe in him. You are telling the public that this is who I believe in now. You are telling the public, he is now my Lord and my Master. And you are deep into the water of baptism. And you don't struggle with the person baptizing you. You surrender. You submit. And that baptism is a sign. It's an evidence that you have submitted to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And he washes away your sins, not the water of baptism. The water doesn't wash away anything. The water baptism is to show an evidence you have surrendered to Christ and that Christ has washed you with his blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can take all my stain away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh precious is the flow that came to your heart and washed you white as snow. And look at the last part. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Spiritual gift. Salvation. It's a gift. 
sanctification, holiness is a gift he gives us. Baptism in the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Ghost is also a gift that he gives us. Look at verse 39. In verse 39, for the promise is unto you. Again, I pray, read the scripture. I may be on my knees. If I'm feeling sleepy, I might stand up. And I read that and I said, Lord, you give me a promise. And you said you have gift for me. Thank you for the gift of salvation, for the gift of sanctification, for the gift of holiness. I come for the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. You said the promise is unto me. So I will have the same gift of the Holy Ghost you gave to those people in Bible days and they were strong and they could not be intimidated by anything or anyone the promises unto me and then to your children to my converts if you have got it as a gift why don't you teach your converts why don't you teach when you're when you're doing follow-up why don't you tell them there's a power from heaven. There's authority from heaven. There is unction from heaven. And you see, give like you got the gift. You'll tell them to you. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. What? What does that mean? To all that are far off. You know, you come from Jerusalem. At that time, there was no aeroplane. And to go from Jerusalem to Nigeria, where I come from, that's far. And to go to any Asian country from Jerusalem, and there is no aeroplane, that's far. And it says to them that are far off. That means then to the people who have the gift of salvation here, the promise is unto them that are far off. And the promise is unto you. I said the promise is unto you. Yeah. If I say, if you've been to Jerusalem before, since you were born, can you raise up your hand? Only very few will raise up their hands. And I say, you have not been to Jerusalem. You have not been to Jesus. And you say, Pastor, that place is far. That's what the Bible is saying. You are far away from Jerusalem. But the gift is not far away from you. The gift is unto you. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Has he called you to salvation? Have you received the call to salvation? Look at this. Even. As many as the Lord a God shall call. The gift of salvation. Sanctification too is a gift. And the gift of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I'm coming to First Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 7. First Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Have you heard of the gifts of the Spirit in the plural? The gifts of the Spirit. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom. A word is a small part of a sentence. A word is a small part of a paragraph when you're reading. A word, one single word, is a small part of the whole page. One single word is a small part of the whole book. A book of thousands of pages. And you look at just one word, small. What it means is God has all the wisdom that will fill a big book. Even go beyond a big book. But he gives the gift 
of the word of wisdom. Wisdom that fills the whole universe. He knows everything about everybody. And he can plan good things for everybody. But when you need in your little corner, your small life, in your little uh, calling, you need wisdom. Well, out of the ocean of wisdom, he gives you the word of wisdom. And then it says to another, the word of knowledge. Not all the knowledge that God has, just a word of knowledge that you need for this hour and for this time. He gives you the word of knowledge by the same spirit. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, he tells us to another faith by the same spirit. And then to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit. Come to the next verse in verse 11. It tells us in verse 11. But all these walkers that one and self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. The gifts of the spirit, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, prophecy, discerning of spirit. He gives that. He gives the gift of faith and the gift of healing and the gift of working of miracles and the gift of speaking in different kinds of languages, tongues, diverse tongues, and the gift of interpretation. All gifts. And he gives to everyone severally, to every man severally as he will. That gift, knowledge, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirit, those gifts, how many of them can you have? Depending on how you profit in the ministry, pick up one man, even in the Old Testament, and you have Elisha. Look at the army coming. And they were going to arrest him and take him away to a foreign country. He had the word of knowledge. He knew that they were coming. And what will he do? What wisdom, what practical thing will he apply? He knew how he will apply the wisdom. And when they came, where he will direct them? Word of wisdom. The word of faith. Lord, make them blind. And they were blind. And he said, I'll take you to the man, the real man you are looking for. They were soldiers. And they submitted to the person they came to arrest. They had the working of miracles as a gift. And then they got to the man. And that's the man, the king. That they were looking for, really. And he said, Lord, open their eyes that they may see the gift of faith. And their eyes were opened. How about the gift of healing? Naaman came. He was full of leprosy. The same man, Elisha, he said, go tell him, go wash in Jordan. Seven times, deep yourself there, come out, you'll be all right. And he didn't change that. The man got hungry, a banner, papa, you know, better than all the waters of Israel. The man has given the word, and when the people, when they pleaded with him, Master, if he had told you to do something greater, wouldn't you have done? And I went in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. It was in Jordan. It came out healing at uh, taking place. I'm saying uh, if one man in the Old Testament could have seven of the gifts apart from speaking in tongues and interpretation, which was reserved for the New Testament people, if he could have you will have. 
After all, it's gift. It's not something I pay for. It's not something that you pay for. You must have your own portion. Now we come to the New Testament and I look at Paul. As you look at Paul, you think of the word of knowledge he had, word of wisdom he had, and you're thinking of the discerning of spirit. Look at that damsel. These are the men of God that show unto us the way of salvation. And at the right time, he looked back and cast out that devil. The devil was saying the right thing, but... It wasn't by the spirit of the Lord and he cast him out. And think about his gift of prophecy. As he talks about rapture, as he talks about the day of the Lord, think about the power of faith. And the sang and, you know, praised the Lord. The prison doors were open. All their chains and shackles, everything went away. And think about the gift of healing. They preached the gospel there. And then one man who had never walked in his life looked at Paul, and Paul looked at him without going to touch him. He said, rise up on your feet. And he rose up and began to walk. All the nine gifts of the Spirit, Paul the Apostle, had because it's available for the followers of Christ in the New Testament. And thank God it's available for you. Amen. I said it's available for you. Amen. What do I do? What do I pay? No, nothing to pay. Jesus paid for it all. And so you can have spiritual gifts as you are seekers of souls for the kingdom. And any gift you need, they're all available for you. I come to point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at sustaining goals by shepherds and subjects under his kingliness, under his royalty. Now, we're seeing children playing. Those children are on the field there. They have a round thing that we call a ball. And then they're playing and they're shouting and they're running. But there's no goal post. And because there's no goal, goal post, they're just amusing themselves in life. If you do not have a goal, something you drive at, something you pursue, a definite goal, you are just amusing yourself. That thing, the football, those children are playing, does not get to any record. And they do not have a stadium, spect a stadium spectators. Why? They don't have goalposts. They're just doing that and while in a wait time, how many of us in our lives like those children, we don't have any goalposts and we don't score anything because you have to have the goalposts while you're playing the game of life and the game of ministry. You have to have a goalpost so that you can make a score. The same thing as we are called of God. What's my goal? What's your goal in life? What's your goal in ministry? What's my goal? I, as I come here, I want to encourage the ministers. And I want to see everything I do, everything I say, every handshake I have, every interaction I have. I want to encourage. I want to enlighten. I want to energize. And I'm checking up what I've said, what I've preached. Have I encouraged anyone as a goal? Have I enlightened anyone as a goal? Have I evangelized anywhere, any day? That's the goal. Have I edified anyone? 
That's the goal. Have I energized anyone? The one that was weak before, suddenly he realizes I can be strong in the Lord. I have a goal and I pray that goal will be fulfilled in your life. You ought to have a goal. And they ought to be sustained growth. A goal. Not a goal that, you know, I have to do because somebody came and called me, come, come, come. Something good is taking place here and I get fired up. And then I go there because it says something is going on there and the fire is like bush fire. You know, bush fire, you see that uh, forest there, you see the bush there, and the farmers are getting the grass and the leaves and everything together, and they put it on fire, and within a short time, it's gone. No, not that kind of fire. So stage goals. I have the goal now. Tomorrow I wake up, I still have the goal. And next week I wake up, I still have the goal. Sustained goals by shepherds, by subjects, under his royal kingly power. And that is the reason you are here. If you don't have any goal yet, God will give you a goal. A goal worth living for. A goal that is worth laboring for. That you say, I am a man, I am a woman with a goal. Amen. 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 Yeah. It's goal that makes your life meaningful. The drive. You know somebody, <laughs> you meet your driver and you say, Driver, I like your driving. Driver, I see you. You are the, at, behind the wheel all the time. By the way, Mr. Driver, where are you going? Oh, the man said, that's a difficult question. Where am I going? Hey, because you are driving. I thought you were going somewhere. No, sir. I just love uh, driving. It doesn't have any goal. doesn't have any destination. Are you like that? You swear to expand life and energy. And you are driving and driving. And I say, can you slow down so I can talk to you? Or you say, yes, I'd like to talk to you too. I said, what's your goal in life? Because I see you're passionate. And you're always pursuing, and you're laboring, and you're exercising everything you've got, we got, we call energy. Where are you going? What's your goal? <laughs> Pastor Preacher, we don't think of goals here. We just think of activity. My father did it very active. And his father, my grandfather, did it very active. And me too, as you know, a child and grandchild, I just copy granddad and I copy my dad as they were active. So I am active. And when you come to the last day on earth, what would you tell God you have done in reaching a goal? Oh, Pastor, I don't think I'll tell God anything more than the fact that he knows I was active. He knows I was proactive. He knows that I run, I walk, I climb, I descend, I do quite a lot. He knows that I'm not a lazy man. I'm active every day. Uh -huh. Your activity. What will each have Accomplish, you know, God is not looking for activity, He's looking for accomplishment. And the accomplishment is the goal. You will have a goal. I said you will have a goal. I'm looking at Luke chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 42. Luke chapter 4, 
We're looking at verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into the desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. That's Jesus. They wanted to localize Jesus. They didn't understand he, the savior of the world, of the world, of the world. They wanted to make him the active savior of this locality. That's what they would do to you if you don't have your own goal. That's what they would do to you if you don't know why you're on earth, why you came, why you're living and where you are going. They say, stay here. Would you imagine if Jesus had stayed in that one location? Stay here. Can you imagine what would have happened when you said you should not depart from them, from this place. Look at the next verse in verse 43. In verse 43, and he said unto them, I must, I must, is there any must in your life? If you have a goal, and you're looking at the goal, and you're reaching for the goal, you say, I must get there. You will get there. I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. That's goal. That's a goal. That is a goal. I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. Look at this. Look at this. For therefore am I sent. That's a goal. For therefore am I sent. Wonderful. Everyone the Lord called, he sent them to do something. Moses, go to Egypt, get those people out, and bring them to worship on this mountain, and take them to the land of promise. That is a good Joshua. Moses, my servant, is gone. Now arise. And take the people to the land. Every place, the feet, the source of your fish shall tread upon that I have given unto you. Cross over this Jordan. Bring those Jericho walls down and distribute and divide all the land for the 12 tribes of Israel. That is the goal. Ezra. Teach the people and bring them back to the land. That is the goal. Nehemiah, you're now in the king's palace. That's not the ultimate for you. Go back to the land. Ezra is gone. And go and reorganize everything and build the broken walls. That's the goal. Peter and Andrew, fishermen. James and John, you will become fishers of men. And you are not just going to be here at the riverside. You will be fishers of men. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there was a sound from heaven. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The tongues of fire came upon them. And they spake in tongues that the Spirit gave them utterance. Then, lower in the chapter, it says, And Peter rose up and said, Ye men, these men and these people are not drunk, as you think of uh, being drunk. But they have received the Holy Ghost now. This is what Christ has given because it's now in heaven at the right hand of the Father from on high. That's the one you crucified and God raised him up from the 
dead. And he said, men and women, what shall we do? And he told them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you. Even those who are far off, you must many of the Lord our God shall come. And with many other words did he testify unto them. And they that gladly received the word, about 3,000 souls were baptized. That is the goal. He led to the riverside fishing for the fish and he came to the Pentecost side and now thousands came to the Lord. That is the goal. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, ye shall do, and greater work than ye shall ye do, because I go to the Father. And here, the, you know, the work is going to be done. They saw that man at the beautiful gate, silver and gold, abide none, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he held the man, lifted him up, that's the goal. That's the goal. You leave that riverside. You caught nothing last night. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men a goal. Paul said, Lord, what would you have me do? He's a chosen vessel. He will reveal my name, my salvation to kings and to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And he will open their eyes and he will turn them from darkness unto light. And he will turn them from the power of Satan unto the power of God. And Paul the apostle went up and he said at the end, I have kept the faith. I've run the race. Now, a crown of righteousness is waiting for me. Not only for me, but everyone that loves is appearing. Jesus had a goal. And the end of the cross is said, it is finished. What are we going to think if you come to the end of life and the goal you just realized I'm dying, I'm leaving but the goal is set before me I've not even touched one percent of that goal and yet life is now about over. I pray you will not regret on the final day none of us here will regret on the final day he called you you have responded to the call. You consecrate yourself to that call. And then finally, you will go on and work and work and work for the Lord. And at the end, you will say, I have finished the work he has given me to do. And when you leave here and you go to the great beyond, angels will be standing at attention. And they'll say, welcome, welcome. Look at the man. Look at the woman. He's a man of goals. He's a man, a woman of goals. And he spent everything that he had to accomplish the goal. Welcome. And Jesus will come to meet you and say, welcome. Well done. Well done. I give you the goal. You didn't uh, shut back. And you didn't uh, fall. You didn't faint. Now you are here. Welcome. Follow me. You followed me on earth. Follow me now. I'm going to take you to your mansion. You have a mansion in heaven. You have a mansion in heaven. Fulfill feel the goal. Don't look here and look there. Don't bother about what anybody does or says. Be a man of a goal. A woman of a goal and accomplish what God has called you to do. It will be glorious for you for all eternity. Amen. Amen. Let's rise up now we will pray. You are receiving greater grace. You are having greater gifts. And you have a new goal for achievement. The Lord will begin to move you. Begin to lead you. And begin to channel your efforts in the right, better, higher, greater direction.
Today, you are not the person you were yesterday. You are not the man, the woman you were yesterday. The days of weakness are ended. The days of confusion are ended. And a new day, a new day, a new day starting today in your life. Where are you? Where are you? What's your heart? What's your soul? What's your mind? You have already given yourself to the Lord. And the Lord is giving himself to you. Raise up your hand. Father, we well, thank you. Grace above the grace of the past. Beyond the grace of the past. Lord, put upon everyone in Jesus' name. Grace for sustained salvation. Grace for sanctifying experience. Grace for steadfastness. And grace to stand in suffering or persecution. Grace for service. Grace for success. Grace for soaring high. Give to all your people, your sons, your daughters, in Jesus' name. My Lord, whatever you give is real. Whatever you give will be manifest. And I pray the manifold grace of God will be upon everyone. You, that person there in particular, claim it for yourself. Perceive it. Receive it. Believe it. You have it in Jesus' name. Lord, gifts for the hour. Gifts for the harvest. And gifts for a happy, successful life and ministry. Grant to everyone in Jesus' name. The concept of weakness take away from everyone. The heart palpitating, can I, can I, can I take, can I from everyone and replace it with I can. Lord, give the confidence to everyone with Christ in me. With Christ reigning in me, I can. Say, I can. I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, I pray that the gifts will begin to manifest in the pastors, the preachers, the members, the ones you have called. The gift of the word of knowledge, of the word of wisdom of the discerning of spirits the gift of faith the gifts of healing the gifts of the working of miracles the gift of prophecy the gift of diverse kinds of tongues the gifts of interpretation lord i pray make a higher labor higher servant, higher worker of everyone here in Jesus' name. Lord, set a goal before your people. Something to look at. Something to run after. Something to pursue. Something to be passionate about. Lord, I pray you set the goal before everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray the steadfastness to set a face like a flint that nothing will divert us. Nothing will redirect us another way. Nothing will distract us. Focus mind. 
fixed mind, faithful mind that is going and pursuing, accomplish it in every life. Lord, nobody here is a failure anymore. Nobody here is set aside anymore. Bring everyone to the center of your will. And to the center of the work you've given us to do. Make everyone accomplish. Make everyone to come in, do the work, and achieve. May the success of the Spirit follow you back home. May the soaring of significance in ministry follow every one of you to the field of ministry. Every woman, every man, every young person, every elderly person, give them something to do they have never done before. And put testimony in every life. Testimony in every minister. Men and women of accomplishment. Confirm it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.